it's Leah Brick. We're here again for Conversations from the Couch. And today I am thrilled to have Deb Kaplan with me. Welcome, Deb. So glad that you're with us today. Thank you, Leah. It's an honor. I'm excited to talk with you and to talk a little bit about what we're, we have planned. Well, why don't you just jump right in? Let's talk about the webinar that you've got coming up. And it just seemed like a perfect time to talk about sex, money, and power. Tell us a little bit more. Well, to begin with, I'm sure those three words can be incredibly activating. And when we uh, talk about sex, money, and power in relationship to relationships, partners, intimacy, sexual health, and sexual expression, uh, oftentimes I hear people get somewhat, um, how would I say, aware that when sex and power are put in the same context, that there might be a negative implication for some individuals, as if to enjoy one sexual power, to enjoy one sense of self is too selfish or perhaps even too self-absorbed and that I don't want to be more powerful than my partner. And while I know we're diving into the deep end of this context, I often tell couples to embrace. I, I invite them to embrace curiosity about their sexual expression, about power and how it's either shared or negotiated in their relationship. And from that curious platform, from that perspective, we work with what's happening in a coupleship. And the webinar really was an opportunity to bring therapy to the, to the uh, large internet audience. And for those that may not have it, into a therapist and talk about their relationship, it was an opportunity to bring the concepts of sex and money and power together because oftentimes in the bedroom, there is a, a huge disconnect around money and financial power, and there is an impact on the sexual expression in the relationship. So let's, let's start with, it's a great time for us to, to get together because you are doing a webinar for us. And I'm going to pull up that that webinar title so that I have it right, Building Advanced Clinical Skills to Master the Dynamics of Sex, Money, and Power in Relationships. And you're doing that, the four-part series for us, you're doing it in March and April. So uh, we'll give more information about that at the end, but I think it's important that we start with what is power and how do you define that? Because that has such a, you know, a different connotation for lots of different people. So can, can we start there with, you know, defining power and what it means in, in a sexual relationship? Absolutely. And I think it is a great place to start because we often talk about the word power and the concept, <clears throat> but it's the ability. If, if Let's start with the, with the basics. Power really speaks to the ability to act or produce an effect, the capacity for being acted upon, and the possession of, because those who have power don't always have control. And so it could be possession of control or authority or influence. But power is also associated with capacity for self-growth. The fact that I can feel empowered or feel falsely disempowered is, a, is very important and has to take, be taken into consideration. And for the clinician working with these very strong dynamics in relationship. It's important to know where a couple feels they are in their, within themselves, intra-psychically and inter-psychically within the relationship. So in that relationship, what is the power dynamic or what is power in a relationship? How does, how does that work? That's exactly the question I prompt clinicians to have with their clients, with their patients, and for people to have with themselves. What does power look like in my relationship or in this relationship I'm working with? How is it negotiated? Is there a power differential? Which by the way, the fact that there is a power differential is not in question. No relationship does not experience this at some point. Said another way, 
all relationships will, will experience power differentials, be it financial, sexual, social, um, uh, psychological. How it's negotiated though is what we have to look at. And the fact that there is power differences is, is not a negative. And I really want to impress this upon the audience. If this is not negative in connotation or does not indicate problems, conflict can happen and within conflict is opportunity and growth. So couples can explore what power means and the power differentials and how they show up for them. I'm really glad that you said that, that it doesn't mean that it's a problem because that's immediately where my mind was going is that, oh, if there's a power differential in the relationship, then obviously there's some kind of problem in that relationship. But what, what happens in the sexual relationship then with, with this kind of power differential? That's a, a, a very general question that can be fleshed out, and I say that with intention, I, I think it's an important question that couples have to ask and explore, either if it's in therapy or explore for themselves. Oftentimes, I know that couples feel sexual differences or conflict around sexual expression might be what brings them for help or guidance. What many couples don't understand is that the financial conflicts or power differences often have a um, impact on the sexual expression and the sexual relationship, intimacy in the relationship. Because uh, if we're talking about closeness, intimacy, emotional intimacy and connection, conflict does not really bode well for feeling vulnerable, or wanting to be open with a partner. And sexual expression is really about vulnerability, feeling empowered in oneself, and feeling comfortable and safe, emotionally safe, physically safe. If we begin from the premise of, I don't feel safe with you, partner, or we are having a power struggle, or we are in conflict around money, and I'm not referencing not having enough of this, uh, in other words, not having enough money, financial resourcing, what I'm actually referencing is how do we, you know, who will earn the money? How does it get spent? What is, what, how do I feel about money? Those go a long way. Those conflicts go a long way and impact how our social, uh, our sexual expression gets communicated and exhibited. And so couples can explore what is happening for them to have the conversation or many conversations around how am I feeling about you? What resentments am I carrying or what financial difficulties are we experiencing and how is that impacting us? That's where we start the conversation. If there is a dynamic around sex and money, if there's just a dynamic around sexual differences, I ask couples to explore and maybe even experiment with what's novel and how can they play with power? in their sexual expression and relationship. Now, oh, <clears throat> listening to you describe this, it sounds like these are really becoming intertwined, that sex, money, power are just very tightly intertwined with each other. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the what happens with the intertwining of those three things? For sure. Uh, Leah, understand, and, and I'm glad you're, you're saying it like that, which I want to uh, really let the audience know, this isn't always the case where sex and money are intertwined. It's often. And so that if a couple is experiencing this power dynamic, power struggle around sex and money, we can't avoid one and address the other. They both have to be addressed. If the sexual expression is about feeling disempowered or that one partner is more powerful than the other, then we explore what does that mean for the coupleship? I am not a sex therapist. So I wanna really put that out there to the audience because I am aware, I work with, uh, as a professional, I work with attachment, I work with trauma, I work with sexual, uh, addiction and compulsivity. 
and I work with financial therapy. So I am wanting to be very clear that as a sex therapist, that clinician, that expertise will really help a, a couple dive into what healthy sexual expression in the full spectrum of sex therapy can look like. What I invite my clients to look at is, is there a power differential here? And is there a disempowering by one partner of the other sexually? And how this may show up, for example, if there is a partner who is choosing, and as an agreement, choosing to not contribute to the family or to the partnership financially, do they feel they need to make up for this sexually? And I know that that can sound very uh, stereotypic, in fact, maybe even sexist. However, in the therapy room, I hear this time and again, and I invite couples to bring it into therapy because where else will they have the chance to talk about it without shame and without trepidation? In the, the coupleship, are there certain things that happen how the couple tries to manage those relationships, the, the differentials, the sexual expression? Is it, is it managed through uh, passive aggressive behavior or avoidance? Are there certain things that are characteristic? There's probably no characteristic, but there are some very commonly shared uh, defaults. As human beings, we default to what we know, what we learned. Growing up, if in a family system, we didn't have much of a voice, or maybe we had too much of a voice. I talk about in Battle of the Titans, my most recent book, that I was falsely empowered in my family of origin, in my parents' relationship. And so for me in recovery, what that looks like is sharing power in a relationship, sharing intimacy, and I mean sharing vulnerability, because my default was to be invulnerable. I didn't control, but I was invulnerable, which was very controlling from the very passive position. That's what I witnessed and experienced with my parents, with my mom, to my father. There's much research on, on this topic. I don't know that I've ever seen it. And really, I've, I mean, I've only see, really seen a lot of your work. So where's, where's the research? Where's the founding in this? Oh, there's amazing research, the social psychological research that comes out of, um, out of UC Berkeley and UC Irvine. Uh, Dasher Keltner has done a lot of research among other clinicians with him. We go into that. We, we dive into this okay. in the webinar because there is research that too much power creates a lack of empathy. We become invulnerable to the needs of others. We become almost immune from needing and asking for help. And yet, contradictorily, but with the, uh, with the willingness to stay connected to others, the, those that rise in the ranks of power and those who sustain it, the difference is sustaining power, is recognizing that the needs of others are equally important. And when we stay connected to that, our own sense of power and in feeling authentically empowered is sustaining. And those that rise in the ranks of power hold that position longer because it is not the position is not exploited or from that position, control is shared. What do I do? What do, what do I do if I identify this in my relationship? What, what's next for me? What's next for my coupleship? Yeah, uh, what, what I am telling and what we'll talk about in the webinar is to first try to be, again, compassionate toward oneself and toward the relationship. This is not a death knoll. This is not a downward slide. And many couples come in and say, oh my God, you know, the fact that we argue, the fact that we are in conflict, this is a bad thing. Their words, we're afraid what this means. And I say to them, quite frankly, I am so glad you're arguing because it means you care. One of you, if not both of you, care a lot about what happens here. Now, their interests 
may be misdirected because the outcome is about what they both want, but they may be going about it from a different perspective. So what it really means is to seek out therapists who understand how to work with this dynamic, who are not afraid to step into that place with the coupleship and not to get down and dirty and argue, but to understand what is the meaning of what they are arguing about? What is the power that one is either afraid to hold to share or the power that one is over asserting their, their partnership or over asserting their own sense of power to the relationship. And I, I tell clients, be curious, try not to judge self, try not to judge your partner, very hard to do. We all love to judge as human beings because it comes natural to many of us. Uh, but I invite them to really understand what is underneath, what's driving their need to be right. Wow. <laughs> Driving your need to be right. That's, that's a, that's a big statement because there, that is certainly prevalent in a lot of relationships. For sure. I know that there is good reading out there. You have some fantastic books. If I wanted to find some, some more out about this, certainly your book, uh, remembering the Titans, mastering the forces of sex, money, and power in relationships is well, one it's actually of those. Battle of the Titans. Battle yeah, of the mastery. Titans. Yeah, mm -hmm. Battle of, Battle of the Titans. Right. So that's um, that's that's a great book for for me to seek out. What about other books? Uh, my previous, the prior book that I wrote was for relationships that struggle with sexual and financial betrayal. Again. Um, one of the strongest probably experiences that bring couples into therapy is a form of betrayal, be it sexual, financial, and that working through that. So the, my first book for love and money, exploring sexual and financial betrayal relationships brought the notion together where sex and money are betrayal elements in a, in a relationship. In the years subsequent to that, I wrote Battle of the Titans because so many couples came forward in the lectures that I gave and in the trainings that I gave and said, we don't have addiction or compulsivity in our relationship, but we do have that conflict. And it was very ob obvious to me in the, in the years of the Me Too movement, subsequently to all of the first book in 2013, that there was a need for couples to have a book around what can we do around conflict and power dynamics, wherein there is not compulsivity or addiction present. And that's what prompted the next book. I'm currently uh, writing another book, which is a roadmap for couples, the financial roadmap for how couples can work through conflicts around money and to do so productively. That won't be out until much later this year. Um, and what I encourage couples to do is to look for podcasts. I have several podcasts on my website, DeborahKaplanCounseling.com, on social media, and other colleagues of mine who I've trained who understand this dynamic and really welcome working with it because they're not afraid to really help couples work through their own power struggles. You know, I when you were talking about couples that don't have addiction or don't have compulsivity, and it's not to say that every newly married couple would have that, but I, I, it just made me think, gosh, you know, for my, I've got older children that, that wouldn't this be great, the battle of the Titans and even your roadmap book that you're writing be great for young couples starting out in relationships to forego maybe some of the problems that come up in a relationship like mine. My husband and I have been married 34 years. We're very oh, wow. ingrained, very ingrained now in our, our relationship and, and what happens in our relationship. And, and so, gosh, two great resources for young couples that are just starting out. Yeah, um, I love the fact that you mentioned young couples. Uh, it actually, just the other day, I was at the dentist and the dentist asked me, what have you been up to lately? And I talked a little bit about money and, and this book and such. And he actually, I mean, I've known him for many, many years. Um, and he brought his son in who's in the practice and his son was fascinated. He said, where do I learn about this? Where, where do I learn 
about money and relationship. And I said, you probably didn't learn it in school. Your parents probably taught it by way of being modeled, but we don't teach this. And I, I hope that this really becomes for, uh, in the forefront of education and modeling and helping launch children into their adulthood and to understanding that this is a dynamic, a very healthy dynamic, does not have to be a, an unhealthy dynamic in their relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I have a younger child still at home, 14 year old, and you know, I, I want him to enter adulthood with healthy money habits, healthy sexual health. I mean, look at the work I do. And, and so, you know, to have that identity as a young man, uh, a young white man even, um, is really important. Yeah, uh, race is a big piece of this that I, I do feel compelled that I, I want to address because we do address it in the webinar. We cannot talk about power, sexual and financial power without addressing the power differentials that are societal and racial. And there is a very um, strong intergenerational awareness of what money means, what power means when we talk about different races, different demographics, different populations, LGBTQ. Uh, and that is all we address that. Unfortunately, I, I, I've done trainings on it in, in, uh, for days on end, but we address it in one of the webinars because I think that concept, that topic and those issues have a very strong seat at the table and have to be included. So whether young white males males of color have to have these conversations and how females address this in their lives. And the fluidity of sexual and gender expression really do impact one's sense of self and power. Let's give some other teasers for the webinar. What other things are you gonna be talking about? Ah, all the fun stuff, uh, the, the, the little bits. The, uh, how to identify healthy kink or non-normative sexual power expression. We're going to learn and define relational currency in relationship. Uh, we're going to talk about attachment, our attachment styles as young children, and how that might show up in our adult romantic relationships or other relationships. And we're going to learn and talk about how financial and sexual exploitation can be exhibited and what to do about it. So the webinar is going to be starting on Friday, March 18th, running through Friday, April 8th. Is that right? That's correct. Each, each webinar is an hour and a half. So we're looking at uh, six hours CEs and, and they'll um, be able to get some credits for that. But it sounds like a really, they're getting a wealth of information maybe that they haven't seen before. Um, and from you, who is just so knowledgeable about this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. I, I'm, I'm very excited. It's, it's, um, I'm very passionate about these topics, and I, I can't help but really uh, come alive because I want to help empower healthy relationships uh, on a sexual level, on a financial level, and what better way to do it to uh, train clinicians who then bring it out to their population or for themselves. You know, come as a clinician and come as the person you are and, in, and on so many levels, take what you need and leave the rest. But I'm excited to bring this to the SASH community and to the clinicians at large. That's fantastic. You mentioned your website earlier, debkaplancounseling.com, correct? Uh, Deborah Kaplan Counseling.com. Deborah Kaplan Counseling.com. So if people are looking for more information about your practice or they want to know what you do, um, read more about your books, obviously they can go there. And where else are we going to be seeing you anytime soon? You can find uh, those uh, individuals who come looking can find me on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook accounts, um, in all bookstores, online booksellers as well. And of course, anyone who contacts me, if you email me through my website, you'll always get an answer. Uh, if you don't, I tell people it's because I didn't get your email. Okay, great. Well, thanks for spending time with us today. I really appreciate you just giving us a little teaser for that webinar and what you're gonna be talking about, but just also helping to give us a, a, a little morsel towards 
how that relationship between sex, money, and power are intertwined and, and how we can learn more about it. And then clearly your two books, which we, uh, if you don't know about them, be sure and seek them out. So again, we thank you for your time today and just spending that little bit of, of uh, knowledge with us. Thank you, Leah. It's been an honor.